remarks today, and it was it's a real honor, uh, especially uh, such a treat for for all of us today to have uh, such a such a distinguished uh, pair of leaders, uh, the two uh, G20 Sherpas from uh, two very close allies, the United States and Australia. So thank you, Matt, for inviting me. Um, this this discussion is uh, timely. I, I think it's it's very important. It follows visits uh, to CSIS by um, uh, Foreign Minister uh, uh, Julie Bishop. Uh, she's been here twice uh, since uh, mm. since the Abbott government uh, took uh, took control uh, down under, um, and we have a very close relationship with Australia uh, here at CSIS, and I think that underlines. Uh, in part, the, the very strong discussion between Australia and the United States about things like the global economy and how delicate uh, that is, global economic governments, governance, and, um, and how uh, Asia uh, is organizing itself. I think G, the G20 is particularly significant in this light. Um, there will be one of the largest gathering of leaders ever uh, in Australia uh, in November, November 14th and 15th in Brisbane, when the G20 uh, members meet. And remember, half of those G20 leaders uh, are from the Asia Pacific region. So very, very important discussion uh, for all of us who think uh, about Asia uh, nonstop. I would like to quickly introduce uh, our two guests and Matt. Um, you have their bios, so I won't go into this deeply, but it's always a good sign when you have strong women leaders uh, in charge of something. I, I've noticed that, um, and this is the case uh, certainly here. Dr. Heather Smith is Deputy Secretary of the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, um, I'm sorry, in the Department of the Prime Minister's uh, Office and at, of the Cabinet, and she's Australia's G20 Sherpa. I really loved seeing that she um, has her PhD from ANU, uh, which is, a, for th those of us who do Asia, is one of the, uh, it's like a vortex <laughs> in the world, uh, <laughs> one of the locuses of the most uh, prescient thinkers about Asia and economics. Um, she held obvi obviously other uh, very important um, roles uh, as she was working through her career including the Office of, uh, of National Assessments, which is another favorite of ours here at CSIS. So love <coughs> seeing that. Um, welcome to, to Washington. And Carolyn Atkinson uh, is um, the Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics at the White House. She has ably uh, succeeded uh, Mike Froman uh, in that position. Um, and for her sins, uh, for taking that position, she's also the G20 Sherpa. Um, Mike uh, Froman had that position uh, before he went over to USTR. Matt Goodman is, is perfectly uh, positioned to moderate today's session. He, was, uh, he worked for um, Mike Froman at the White House. When Mike was the Sherpa, and the Sherpa is the, is the leader's personal representative to, to, the, uh, to the G20, so both these women play that role. Matt was Mike Froman's yak. Um, and I, I, and I, I, I begged him not to make me say that, but he said, you're going to have to say it. And, um, and I, I'm not even going to try to explain what that means. But, um, Matt, with that, I'll, I'll leave the yakery over to you. And all right. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Froman used to call me a yak of all trades uh, because I did, I did a, lot of, a lot of things for him. But I'm bummed. That's good. I've had my coat trimmed uh, since then. So, uh, but uh, thank you, Ernie. And uh, let me join Ernie in welcoming everyone to CSIS, especially our distinguished guests, uh, Heather Smith and Caroline Atkinson. And let me also say a word of uh, welcome to people online who are watching us. Uh, we know we have a big uh, following online and on Twitter at CSIS uh, with, I think, a hashtag CSIS Live. Is that right? Um, so uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, so the G20, in my mind, is really about three things. It's about problem solving in the extreme crisis management, but basically problem solving about agenda setting for the global economy and about, uh, about building habits of cooperation among a group of countries that have not had, uh, not all have had uh, the experience of participating in global economic governance. So I'm gonna frame my questions around sort of those three broad areas. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna, because we started a little late, I might steal a few minutes at the end if our guests and, and yeah, all of you will me. allow um, but, but basically, I'll sort of truncate my part of the questioning, and then we'll move to questions from the floor. 
Um, so let me start with the problem solving part and ask kind of both of our uh, guests what they're worried about. And, and I think it would be uh, um, not uh, uh, sensible to start without asking about the issue that everybody is, is uh, reading about in the papers these days, which is Ukraine. I'm not going to ask about the geopolitics of Ukraine, but I would be interested in, Caroline, your view of what's at stake economically and what the challenges are uh, in Ukraine. Well, thanks very much, Matt, and, uh, and thanks very much to all of you, and apologies, because I think it's my fault that we started a bit late, or uh, my boss's fault, <laughs> something like that. Uh, <clears throat> for Ukraine, it is um, obviously an important economy in, in Europe. It's not huge, but uh, and it is one that is, has been badly mismanaged, but has um, a promising future and can have a promising future. Right now, there are a lot of pressures. There are financing pressures. And uh, there is need to take a difficult uh, reform measures, including, importantly, in the energy field where there have been expensive subsidies. And uh, one of uh, the other areas is on exchange rate management and budgetary management. We are encouraged by the fact that the government uh, now in Kiev is, uh, has committed itself to uh, doing reform. It has invited in a team from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which is already there. And as you will have seen on Sunday, G7 finance ministers uh, agreed on um, strong support for Ukraine multilaterally and bilaterally and called on others to put forward support. We did that. Uh, Overnight Sunday, Monday, Secretary Kerry and then Secretary of Finance Minister Liu put out statements about the kind of support that we in the United States are preparing to give to Ukraine, which includes a $1 billion loan guarantee, which we need to have authorized by Congress, along with our, uh, we hope, with uh, our support for IMF quota reform, because the IMF will be a big part of any financing package. We're also looking in particular at four areas for Ukraine, technical assistance in monetary and exchange rate management, where we've got uh, advisors already on the way or on the ground. Uh, a very important uh, issue, both politically and also uh, for good governance. We're, we're sending some support for anti-corruption measures and also for asset recovery, legal experts. And we expect that we will pull together, that international experts on that will come together from the major uh, financial centers soon. Uh, we are also looking, uh, giving them support on energy reform and on uh, understanding the legal basis or how to deal with any trade issues that may arise. So we're uh, in there. And today, I think the EU announced uh, that they were ready to put up money. So uh, we can see the shape of a financing package that co could go along for Ukraine to support reform. And, and I think that will all be very positive. As you said, leaving aside the enormous uh, political security uh, and other issues. And as you will have seen, of course, the G7 also came together to, uh, to uh, say that, um, Again, on Sunday, the leaders all said that uh, it was uh, unacceptable that the violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. And they gave leaders support also for uh, Ukraine's um, financing to help Ukraine's political and economic situation. OK, thank you. I'm sure we're going to come back to that topic. But, um, but let me uh, turn to Heather and ask more broadly about the when you look out on the global economy, what are you worried about? What do you think the big challenges are today? Mm. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Ernie, and thank you very much for, for coming along today. It's a, it's a very important forum, so Australia is, is very, very uh, proud to have the presidency, and we see ourselves as stewards of, of G20 through this year, and hopefully we, we will leave G20 in a, in a better space when, when we finish by November. I think the, the key thing that uh, is on our minds is really the concern about the pace of global growth over the next decade. And uh, we're obviously in a very multi-layered transition when it comes to the variability of growth across the global economy and also within G20. We're seeing a cyclical recovery uh, in, in uh, a number of economies from the very deep recession that we've seen since the financial crisis. But we're also still in a process of ongoing repair of dealing with financial stresses uh, in the system. 
So the real challenge we face is how do we, how do we increase the growth potential of, of the global economy? And I think even though we are coming out of a, uh, uh, the, the deepness of, of uh, the crisis, when you look at the actual indicators, we, we still have potential output. GDP per, per output is still 8% below what it was between 1998 and 2005. And this is before the, the lead up to the financial crisis when growth was very strong. So the OECD tells us that that gap won't actually close until 2021. So we've got a lot of catching up to do in terms of growth. But I think uh, coming back to that key question is where is the, the next driver of growth in the, in the international system? Um, we've seen the US performing better. I think the EU is showing signs of, of turning the corner and Japan under Prime Minister Abe is embarked on a very, very ambitious um, three arrows approach. I think it's going to be very important that the structural reform element of that uh, really, uh, really uh, becomes important in, in driving Japanese growth, but also is important for, the, for Asia and also for the rest of the world. But I think we still have a policy mix that's unbalanced across, across the world. Um, we have uh, fiscal policy that still is very much focused on consolidating public sector balance sheets. So from Australia's point of view, we think focusing on both the macro economic coordination aspect as well as structural form is really the, the avenue on which to, to try and build momentum within the G20. I think the, the other issue we need to be clearly concerned about is the high level of unemployment across the world. The, the ILO does not see any real growth in jobs in the immediate future and that is very concerning for all of our for all of our economies and all of our societies. So we really do need to think about how to raise participation in the global uh, economy and also looking at, at labour market policies within, within all of our economies. Trade is also uh, an area when you look at the overall trends, it's well below the, the growth rate of the last three decades. I think we've seen some improvement uh, more recently, but this is quite concerning. Trade has always been a very important engine of, of global growth, and there may be structural features that are underlying that, but there are also <coughs> cyclical features and real barriers to countries engaging in trade. So, so we really do need to, to think about that. I think also, um, in terms of what's, what's concerning, are the underlying features of the global economy. And there'd be two things that, that I would highlight. Firstly, is that global interdependence is key to all of us. Um, but I, I get the sense over recent years that there's been some waning in the commitment to try and enhance our global interdependence. And that's perhaps not surprising given the, the deep recessions that, that some economies have faced. But it really is important to generating global growth that we integrate more with each other going forward. I think also when it comes to policy making, um, we've seen um, enormous reductions in poverty across the world over recent decades, and that's given rise to, to middle classes in, in many parts of the world which uh, now have a, a, very, a very strong and a very good voice in, in, in many countries. And that empowerment, I think, has really raised expectations of what governments can deliver and what they can't deliver. So that's a very positive force in many ways, but it's also getting harder for governments to make deep reforms. And I think we, that brings us back to how we have to have a number of constituencies and a number of other forces that, that can help, um, help governments embark on reform. It is not, it's not just the, the role of government. So I see some of those underlying trends uh, also as being perhaps concerning going forward as we try to uh, embark on addressing some of these challenges. Okay, thank you. That's a very good overview, and, and we'll come back to sort of how you plan to, to uh, address some of those issues. But um, Caroline, what's your view of the global economy, and where do you think the, the areas of most concern are, whether in the advanced world, the emerging world, China, wherever you think is uh, the place we should be focused on? For all of the G20, the big issue is, as Heather said, uh, getting a strong and stronger recovery from the recession. 
Uh, we are certainly in a recovery. We, the private sector has been adding jobs for, for many quarters now in the United States, but unemployment is still too high, and we need to work. And the President's budget today lays out a lot of, uh, a lot of issues uh, and places that we think we can make progress. Uh, internationally, that's also important. Internationally, what, what we've tended to say is uh, be ambitious, go for the jobs, go for growth. We don't need to settle for um, a kind of suboptimal recovery. And one of the problems with this uh, slow recovery is that people who are out of work tend to stay out of work for longer. And so the long-term unemployed are a major problem in the United States that we're taking specific measures to look at. In some other economies, in Europe for, in particular, youth unemployment is a very particular uh, problem. Um, the other, so the overall frame of we've got to grow faster than, than we would do if we didn't take action, I think, is completely right. Uh, we also have to grow in a balanced way. We haven't got rid of the problem uh, that, was, that was identified early on in the, uh, in the G20 of the, need for, of the fact that growth had become unbalanced in the world with some very big surpluses, some very big deficits. We all need to grow um, sort of domestically, and we can't grab growth from each other. Uh, so that's part of the very uh, nature of the, of the G20. A couple of other issues, special sort of within that frame. Uh, we agree, I think, in the G20 that there is a big infrastructure deficit and investment deficit. China's a little different because they have very high rates of investment, although there is also a case that they need some, um, some improved infrastructure. Obviously, they're growing, been growing very rapidly, so that's not so surprising, but it's a question of where and how and why they invest. Uh, Another issue on the employment side, and I completely agree with Heather, we need to listen to a lot of groups. In fact, I'm going this afternoon to talk to uh, a group at AFL-CIO about how they see the global economy and, and, the, uh, and the G20 agenda. We talk to the B20 as well. Um, another issue is we have a whole lot of the labor force that, uh, or potential labor force that doesn't contribute or that is in informal and, and low paid and unprotected jobs at the moment, and that's women. Um, even though Heather and I are up here, that's still rather unusual, and even in our societies. And we know that in many other societies, the gap between, never mind pay, but just the gap between how many women and men are part of the labor force is, is wide. And if that gap were narrowed, that would yield the possibility of, uh, of particular uh, increase in growth. So we want to look in particular at that during this year. And then finally, uh, as the president has said, and I think that uh, world leaders agree, and the, the UN Secretary General is also, uh, I mean, there's very much high level focus on the issue of uh, climate and energy efficiency. And in the G20, whether it's Beijing, where there are issues of air quality, other countries where, where there have been extreme weather events, including here, uh, or um, impending water shortages, I think there is a growing understanding of the importance of addressing that. And the G20 being, as the last thing I'll say, being a sort of political body when leaders can come together is sometimes able to make a breakthrough you said uh, problem solving and agenda setting. And uh, part of the problem solving, obviously initially, was all around getting, pulling back from a great uh, financial crisis getting worse. Uh, but there, is, there are also other big global problems, getting trade going, but also addressing uh, climate change is a big global problem. Let me, I, I want Heather to have a chance to lay out the Australian uh, uh, framing of, of, of their priorities. But before I do that, let me just ask you about, um, about the challenges in the financial markets in the first you yeah. know, couple of months of this year and, and what you think the sources of that are. Are those a reflection of, and you could sort of look at that glass half full, that you know, the advanced world is doing a little better and so it's highlighting perhaps that the emerging world is not doing as well. Uh, I guess that's an economist's way of being glass half full. Um, but uh, you know, the people are talking about you know, these are very specific idiosyncratic problems in, in individual countries. What, what do you think is going on? Why has there been this volatility in the last couple of months? I think there have been two things going on. One has been a generalized uh, 
pull of funds into the emerge into the advanced economies, and particularly the United States, as markets anticipate that we've got a stronger recovery and that the Fed tapering has begun and maybe it will continue. And there had obviously been a big push of capital into emerging markets, which some emerging markets found quite difficult to manage and felt that that was driving up their exchange rates too, too hard. So that's a kind of secular, secular, secular shift that can lead to volatility uh, as it occurs. Uh, I will say that um, two points about it. One, I think the G20 is an incredibly useful forum even though I know uh, there have been some comments about this, because it does pull together not just the leaders once a year, but finance ministers and central bank governors. They all met uh, in Sydney, I think, uh, earlier. Two I think weeks Sydney, ago. Yes, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, at where they could discuss these issues and how to manage, how best to manage. And that's something that was, just didn't exist mm -hmm. uh, in the old days. So I think that's very important. And another thing that, um, that I think is somewhat reassuring is that many of the... Uh, emerging market economies that have had crises in the past when their exchange rates were fixed now have more flexible exchange rates, more flexible monetary policy, and many of them have built up a buffer of reserves. So the ability to manage this shift, I think, is greater than it might have been. Now, that, on top of that, there are, of course, as you say, idiosyncratic uh, developments. Some countries may look more or less vulnerable than others. And then there are politics, and we've seen politics, geopolitics, security. We've seen that that can also be an issue. So I think those are. Uh, OK. All right, thanks. So Heather, what are you going to do about it? What's the G20? <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what is your, uh, how do you frame your priorities for the, okay. your G20 year? Thanks, Matt. Before I answer that question, I'm not dodging that question, but just to, to reinforce what Caroline was saying, because I was at the, the finance ministers and central bank governors meeting in Sydney two, two weeks ago. And uh, there was a very good discussion, and it does show the evolution and maturity of G20, where you, you can actually now have a very fruitful conversation which, uh, where you see countries coordinating uh, their, their actions, at least in terms of explaining and communicating uh, their intent going forward, and a strong commitment to ensuring that the global economy is resilient and that there are safety nets there. So I think it's quite quite legitimate that you would expect, um, given the normalization of monetary policy across a number of economies going forward, that you would be seeing relative price adjustments taking place in, in economies, um, in addition to the factors that, that Caroline has mentioned. We live in a very heterogeneous world now in terms of what the emerging market economies are. They're not, they're not, they're not a group. It's not like the Asian financial crisis. Um, there's high diversity, and but the fundamentals still remain important you know, in terms of having uh, flexible exchange rates and uh, current accounts that are manageable um, are really just, I think, standard underlying features of any economy at any point in the cycle. And I think you can see a differentiation between economies that have those characteristics and those that don't, notwithstanding the politics also comes into play. Um, so in terms of what we're going to do about it, um, uh, well, we're going to, to try and uh, firstly, um, including what was agreed two weeks ago in Sydney, was to, for the first time in G20, set an aspirational growth goal where we are asking uh, G20 collectively to try and raise uh, global growth by 2% over, over the next five years, which in essence we're we're asking um, economies to rather than have potential growth between 2014 and 2018 at 3.8%, we're trying to, to raise that bar to, to get it to 4.3%. It's an aspiration. Um, it's, it's designed to, to continue to place pressure on all of us to deliver under the G20 agenda. And I think the key key focus words, if you like, for Australia's presidency will be very much around growth, um, resilience and governance, and uh, particularly around growth. Uh, we have inherited a, a good agenda from, from Russia where it was agreed by leaders uh, in St. Petersburg that by the time we get to Brisbane, each country would present a growth strategy. And within that growth strategy, um, we have agreed that we will focus on three key pillars of reforms. The first one uh, is around raising uh, the financing of investment, particularly through infrastructure. Uh, 
Investment as a share of GDP is at its lowest level in 50 years. That tells us that the private sector is very risk adverse. So we really need to look at measures that will facilitate uh, investment, particularly in infrastructure. We know that there are short-term stimulus effects from, from that investment and also long-term productivity and competitiveness effects from, from investment. And there is a huge uh, $70 trillion deficit around the world in terms of in infrastructure investment. The key challenge that, that we face throughout the year is how do we ensure that we have the financing mechanisms? How do we make sure that we are uh, the private sector in particular has a strong role in, in contributing to that and we can come back to that later. Secondly, as Caroline mentioned, labour market participation. Um, it's very important that countries look at their labour markets. Um, we're asking countries to think about individual and collective actions that will help create quality jobs going forward and that we help address the supply and demand mismatch that we see within the labour markets. And that includes such things as what can we do in terms of skills and training and vocational training to help those people who, who are perhaps wanting to enter the workforce or have been unemployed for a long period of time. It's also about thinking about raising the workforce rate. Uh, as Caroline mentioned, I think female participation, youth participation are two key themes that G20 is is wanting to focus on this year. It's, I think female participation is very important for productivity in, in, in all economies, but it also has many important social uh, aspects, as, as we know. The third pillar is around trade. Uh, I think this, this year in G20, we're really wanting to have a conversation that, that talks about trade as a driver of growth. What can we do in our economies unilaterally to increase trade by removing barriers to supply chains. If you think about global trade now, it's not, it's not just final goods crossing borders. Uh, with all, within G20 economies, about 30 to 60% of trade is in intermediate goods, which means they move back and forth, back and forth. There is no such thing as a, as a domestic input. Um, so it's very important that we free up barriers that that enable business to, to have opportunities, which in turn gives rise to activity and helps with, with job creation. So all of those three pillars, as well as what any other reforms economies want to offer up, we are asking countries to put, put these on the table essentially by the middle of this year, um, where through the Sherpas and uh, through the finance deputies process, we, we will seek to assess and engage in a process of, of peer review to try and raise the level of ambition uh, in order to try and meet this, this growth objective. The, the, second, the second area is really coming back to uh, what we were talking about. We're really in the context of Ukraine. How do we ensure that we've got resilience, resilient structures in place to enhance growth, but also to deal with any potential volatility going forward? And following the, the financial crisis, there's been five years of work very good work in the G20 on focusing on, the, on, on strengthening financial regulatory um, uh, issues across all G20 economies. And there's a whole body of work which, through the course of this year, is, is due for delivery. And that's really important because it gives a signal that uh, governments are working on financial stability, that, that people have confidence in the system that it can be reassuring that it will reduce the call on government balance sheets in the event uh, that there's, there's other crises. It's about building confidence in, in the financial system. The other, the other area that the G20 is focusing on is on, on taxation, where uh, if you think about how the world economy has changed, that we have quite outdated taxation arrangements across many countries and that with the mobility of firms, um, you don't always necessarily pay the tax in, in the place where you earn the, the money. So I think leaders are very, very focused on what can we do to uh, ensure that we have greater convergence between our tax administration systems and the movement of profits uh, around the world. There's also a, a perhaps a more esoteric agenda which Australia is, is wanting to focus on and, and that is really around trying to, to streamline the G20 agenda so that we focus on a, f on a few key issues. There's a 
huge amount of work that goes on within G20 that is very important. I would say each president inherits two-thirds of, of that agenda, um, and that's very important work. But from Australia's perspective, we would rather focus on a few key issues and do them well and, and get some really important outcomes, particularly around delivering growth, um, rather than, than focus on, on all issues and, uh, and not really achieve as much as we would like. So that's, that's a broad outline of our agenda. There's some other governance issues that, that, that we can come back to um, that, that mentioned that the role of, of G20, um, but we are thinking about that in the trade and energy space, but we can come back to that. Great, that's a very helpful overview, and, and let me commend to all of you the G20 uh, website, the Australian government's uh, G20 website, which has a nice uh, framing of the growth and resilience mm. agenda with a nice or a table that divides up with different colors, <laughs> if only uh, how these all simple. things fit together. <laughs> it's actually quite quite uh, easy to, to, yeah. to grasp because it is a broad agenda. Um, well, there are a thousand things I want to ask about. I do want to give people a chance from the audience to ask, but let me ask, since you've um, talked about, uh, let me ask two things. First, um, the uh, quota reform you touched on in the Ukraine answer, uh, but this is one of the big, uh, disappointments of, of the G20 that the U.S. brokered and pushed uh, an agreement to try to re, um, reallocate shares and chairs, as, as they're called, in the, in the International Monetary Fund and other international institutions in 2010. And that was a very significant uh, uh, commitment by the G20 in substance and sort of from a perception point of view about the shift of, of the uh, you know, voice in the world um, from the advanced world to the, to the emerging world as it, as it emerged. The United States is the only country in the G20 that has not implemented that, uh, that uh, commitment. And I wonder whether and when we're ever going to do that and uh, what can be done and how we can all help to encourage that. And then I'd like to ask Heather what she thinks about that issue. <laughs> well, I can tell you that, that uh, President Obama is fully committed to uh, getting this support for, we need support from Congress to make this change. We put this forward in the budget last year. We were very hopeful until the last minute uh, in the negotiations of the omnibus bill that we would manage to, uh, to succeed in getting that in the budget. In the end, the price that was uh, put on it was, uh, you know, not appropriate and, and almost uh, the, the negotiations broke down. And what we're very hopeful, but, but since then, and, and urged on by many of you that are here, we have been working from the White House with Treasury, obviously, Jack Lew has been uh, working the phones, but so have we, and with, uh, with also colleagues from the State Department and the Department of Defense. And I've spoken just uh, this week or over the weekend with Secretary Kerry and Secretary Hagel uh, about uh, who are fully on board with the importance of getting this reform legislation passed. So we are hopeful that we can manage to, uh, to press this forward um, in, the, in the coming you know, sh short period ahead. We're well aware that the rest of the world is waiting on us. I think that uh, they've made that very clear in meetings to, uh, to Secretary Liu and also to President Obama, who understands that. It is extremely important that this reform uh, does get passed. Do you want to comment on that? Mm, no, thank you, Matt. I think um, this is a core issue for, for G20 because it goes to um, the credibility of, of the institution to, to deliver. And it's very symbolic um, because the G20 does actually reflect the, I guess, the 21st century dynamic of, of shifting relative weight, shifting economic and strategic weight across the world. So. So the G20 is, is a body that is inclusive, I think, and representative and the institutions that we need for the time. So, so from Australia's point of view, we've been, we've been very, very supportive and, and been um, uh, very much involved in, in this issue for a long period of time because we share our executive director chair, for example, at the IMF with Korea, which we, we made a decision to do this several years ago because we thought it was very important that that other voices now start to have a greater role uh, around the IMF board. But having said that, the administration has worked enormously hard. Caroline has worked enormously hard. The president is very 
very committed and the secretary uh, is is very committed so um, they're they're doing all they possibly can and and that is certainly recognized uh, around the table I think um, we're moving now from a it being a representational issue to really it feeding into how we think about resilience in the global economy and Ukraine is part of that story but the need to make sure that the IMF is seen as, as, a, as a credible, well-funded operating institution that provides safety nets um, when required is really the key here. And that's, that's, that's really important in terms of, of why we continue to need to see quota reform and, and governance. Um, there will be a finance, G20 finance central bank uh, governance meeting here in April around the spring meetings. And it is our hope that that we, we can see some, some movement on this um, uh, in April. But uh, it's very important, a lot of the emerging market economies see it as, as really a um, key indicator of does, do other countries seriously take their voice um, around the table? And uh, it's very important that we keep providing support to the administration, uh, but it's very important for the the credibility of G20 that um, we try and, and uh, get the 2010 reforms moving so that we can then start the 2015 process where we hope to take the governance reform further. Okay, thanks. Well, I, I was going to ask some institutional questions, but I think some of them have been touched on already. And so let me just opine that, that um, I think the as you said, the G20 is under challenge in terms of its legitimacy even uh, because it, it hasn't always been able to deliver on its commitments. And, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's key to me, legitimacy is a function of sort of inclusiveness and effectiveness. Mm. Um, there's a sort of sweet spot there where it has the, enough of the right people in the room getting enough of the right things done. Uh, to be able to then enjoy, you know, uh, broad uh, credibility mm. and, and even legitimacy. So, so uh, uh, Godspeed with uh, with that agenda and uh, streamlining. I think is a great idea. Mm. Um, okay, I'm going to now open it up to questions. We do have microphones. Uh, when you get the microphone, could you please identify yourself and try to ask a, a brief question? Yes, ma'am. In about the third or fourth row there. My name is Nancy Alexander with the Heinrich Boll Foundation. And for all the reasons that the three of you have mentioned, we really appreciate the administration's uh, hard work to get the IMF reform. It, it is so necessary for the legitimacy, and it gave me hope that you're dealing with it at such a senior level. Um, we're working with the Civil 20, which has a very, very trivial amount of clout compared to the Business 20 and even the Think 20. Uh, and that's a concern for us in and of itself. But we have two uh, questions. One is that in 2009, in terms of this uh, same issue of carrying through on commitments, the U.S. proposed in Pittsburgh an elimination of fossil fuel subsidies, and it really seems to be completely stalled. You know, you mentioned it in Ukraine, you know, but how about globally? And um, the Civil 20 has four like loci of work, and one of them is infrastructure. And we have two concerns about that in watching the infrastructure work really over, uh, over five years. One is that the climate work, which is so important, seems to be pretty divorced from mobilizing finance for infrastructure. And I hope that impression is wrong. <laughs> Um, I'd like to hear what you think about it. And, and secondly, there has been no discussion, at least in posted documents and, and communiques about norms uh, in terms of transparency, uh, procurement, uh, freedom of information, social and environmental safeguards. In fact, the St. Petersburg Accountability Report uh, gave the G20 a, a black mark for their work on environmental uh, safeguards. So if you could cover those issues of fossil fuel subsidies and um, the climate impacts of infrastructure and the norms, I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you. A number of questions and comments embedded in that. And while you're thinking about that, let me just clarify for non-G20 watchers that there's been a whole proliferation of other 20 groups, including the civil society or, or C20, I guess. Uh, there's a B20 representing business interests. There's an L20 
there's a T20 uh, yes, think tank uh, group, um, which, uh, <laughs> which is probably the most important of, of all of them. Um, and uh, so just so you keep up with the lexaga, lexicon, it's, it's kind of confusing. Um, Heather, do you want to address either of those? Sets of issues, fossil I'll, fuel I'll, subsidies. I'll, yeah, so well, Caroline uh, is, is working very hard on the fossil fuel subsidies uh, uh, area. So I should say um, more broadly on, on G20, as I mentioned, there's, there's a lot of work that goes on within G20. But sometimes I think it's important to have a discussion what G20 isn't rather than what G20 <coughs> is. And I think when it comes to, to issues, we we have to keep two, two things in mind. Uh, one is where can G20 add value? And secondly, where can the issue be best progressed? And um, I think fossil fuel subsidies is a good one for, for G20 because it helps build political momentum where it is hard to get momentum elsewhere. And Caroline can talk about the, the, the partners that we're, we're trying to, to bring into to that, to that process. Um, on, on civil society, I think, uh, again, what, what I think really matters when it comes to the engagement groups is um, narrowing down the focus of where you think um, can best add value. And I think your focus on, on uh, infrastructure um, and investment around clean, clean energy is, is a good one because it's really up to countries to decide when we're asking them to make commitments around infrastructure where they put their effort. And we know that um, within with the energy and transportation system and water and sanitation in developing countries that they are, they are big gaps. So I would encourage the C20 to, to focus on that. It can focus on any, any particular area, but on the environment and clean energy, I think that's, that's um, really important. On, I think, your, your other question, um, there is an anti-corruption working group that is focusing on, on greater transparency and uh, many of those issues. Now, that, that work is an example of work that just continues to move on. They're, they've done some very good work over recent years. They're doing a review of their work program and are about to embark on a new set of work issues. So. Um, I wouldn't be uh, disheartened by that. I actually think there's, there's some very good work. Australia chairs that working group with, with Italy, um, but I would just caution that G20 cannot focus on, on every issue out there. We really need to, to think about how do we use the political capital of our leaders to best effect, and how do we use the G20 institution for, to best effect, and where can we progress issues elsewhere that may get more traction than perhaps in G20. Good, thanks. Do you want to comment on that? Yes, on, on fossil fuel subsidies, you're absolutely right that this is extremely important. Uh, I, I think there has been progress, not necessarily within the G20 frame, and then there's also been some within the G20 frame. So on the first, in the past two or three years, there's been more focus, including from the IMF, where uh, David Lipton, the first deputy managing director, gave a powerful presentation probably uh, nine months ago or a year ago or something about the economic and fiscal costs of fossil fuel subsidies. And, uh, and there has also been work in the World Bank and with individual countries. There are a number of countries who have been grappling, uh, pressed really by budgetary issues, to uh, deal with this uh, question of reform. And I think there's a part of the issue, goes to your second thing about transparency. Part of what we've been suggesting is that if people in a society know that uh, these subsidies overwhelmingly benefit the wealthy because they're the ones that consume most energy, overwhelmingly benefit large industries because they're the ones that consume most energy and tend to the extent that cheap energy feeds you know, chemical and other uh, industries in some of these uh, countries that have big energy subsidies, they're actually not even labor intensive industries. So the whole structure uh, distorts the economy in a way that is not very um, helpful for leaving aside even the issue of, uh, of energy use and the environment. It's not helpful for uh, the middle classes and the poorer, more vulnerable. Uh, 
And so we've been coming at it in an individual case and encouraging the IMF and the World Bank when they're dealing with individual countries to point out the budgetary costs and to suggest that as you, as countries, put in place a phase, you have to phase these things, a phase reform, that the money gets, uh, the savings get at least partly directed towards the most vulnerable, but with, um, as part of, you know, what we call conditional cash transfers and so on. And that work has actually been going on in a number of individual countries. Now, in the G20, uh, we have been calling for a peer review of as a way to, again, improve the transparency around this issue because a lot of countries will start off saying, well, we don't have any subsidies. And uh, so part of it is just to, uh, to work to come to a common understanding about how pricing works and who it benefits and who it uh, is a cost for. And um, we expect that during this uh, year, and possibly at APEC, but certainly by the time we're, we're in Brisbane, it will be possible to point to some peer reviews that are under, that are, and we've been ready to volunteer for that for, for a while. We're working with partners. A few countries did agree around last year's APEC to do that, and we, it's well, like many of these things, once you get going, then you can expect that there will be more uh, support. Um, so on the other issue of, I, I, I think Heather's absolutely right, that for the various 20 groups, it's important to focus on a few key issues, and we've said that certainly to the B20 and the L20 and so on. And I think that you know the traditional one, you and I have spoken about this before in, uh, in, uh, in, when I was in a different role, uh, the push from civil society for transparency, I think, has really changed the way that many of us uh, work in the public sector, and in particularly mm -hmm. in the international financial institutions, the IMF and the World Bank. There just is much more information out there. And, uh, and we are pressing, uh, Heather mentioned energy, that is another area where there's price volatility in part because there is a lack of transparency mm -hmm. from some big consumers and producers. That's one area, it sounds a little bit wonky, but it's, leaders are not gonna discuss that but it's part of the work that we all have to do as Sherpas and guiding these working groups. And the anti-corruption working group is very important. We, one of my staff has just come back from Australia where he's been working on that issue, um, pressing in the G20 for countries to subscribe to the anti-bribery uh, um, conventions, pressing in the G20 for, and gradually mm. there's peer pressure, um, pressing for the EITI, you know, the Extractors Industry Transparency is another thing that has, uh, that has uh, made progress in, mm. the, in the G20. So uh, I think they're, they're, you know, there's a long way to go, but all of these issues, people get more sensitized to yeah. through yeah. this process. I, I think these are both examples of the fossil fuel subsidies and, and, uh, and the anti-corruption work where you know, all three of the things that I mentioned at the beginning about the G20 come to, come to light. I mean, problem solving, uh, agenda setting, uh, and in that regard, you mentioned APEC. I, I see the Chinese are taking up the fossil fuel subsidies issue because that has both budgetary and environmental implications right. for them, and they, they, they sort of get it. So, so that leads to the third thing, which is it builds habits of cooperation. I think having these conversations mm -hmm. helps to uh, get uh, new players in the conversation and thinking about these issues and, and acting on them. So I think that's very good. Okay, next question. Yes, ma'am, right here. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a cluster take a of questions. questions. So this lady, then that lady, then the woman in blue in the back there. Yeah, <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. I want to thank ICSI for this wonderful event. The White House, I want to thank President Obama for the wonderful initiatives he has put for Africa. I come from Kenya. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Sita. Uh, I wanted to talk something about uh, civil society, women participation, and uh, leaders, uh, young leaders, like the one President Obama is bringing 500 leaders from Africa. I look at this as very important. I asked the Russian Minister for Finance, I attend the World Bank and I'm one of your meetings, I asked him, why don't you put women participation into Oh, the G28 and G20 and the young people, they are the leaders of tomorrow. The, I think things can change if you involve us as women and the young leaders who are leaders for tomorrow because when the leaders go, they'll have to know and want to know what is, what is G20, what does it do? So I think you should put more emphasis on including people, organizations like civil society and women participation and young people. How do we get into 
that as civil society, yes, as the World Bank and IMF annual spring meetings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I would just broaden the question a bit in addition to those points to say, you know, if you could comment on the development agenda within the G20 and mm -hmm. what, what the G20's role can be or should be in, in development issues. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Christy Hughes from Reuters. A question first for Caroline to follow up on your comments on Ukraine. What sanctions could be imposed on Russia and is suspension or exclusion from the, from the G8 an option there? And secondly, for both Caroline and Heather, in terms of regulation of Bitcoin, is that something that could or should be considered at G20 level rather than having countries going it alone, such as Japan's plans currently? Okay. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Uh, Julia Sevchenko, Voice of America. Just to follow up on the Reuters, uh, Reuters right? <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, how do you expect uh, Russian participation uh, being shaped by the current crisis in the upcoming summit? And uh, do you expect under any circumstances uh, that G20 uh, can become G19? <laughs> it's already the G, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, actually, it's already the G52 yeah. if you count the EU and all the invited guests, so it would be 51 or something. Okay, so we have a, uh, a question about development, uh, women and young leaders, um, Russian exclusion, uh, Bitcoins. <laughs> Who wants to take on any of that? Uh, should we start over here, Caroline? Sure, just to, to talk about Ukraine and Russia, first of all, uh, I'm... I referred at the beginning to our leader's statement on Sunday to, uh, I'm not quite sure what the time is now, but I know that um, Secretary Liu is testifying this morning um, on Capitol Hill, and I'm sure that there will be questions and statements from the White House podium. But I don't, and there have been statements out of the EU. On sanctions, I would just say there are a number of different options, and obviously those are being looked at. And there's one issue which is, the actions that have already been taken, uh, which were out, outlined very clearly by uh, U, uh, US UN Ambassador Samantha Power on Monday and by Secretary Kerry yesterday in Kyiv about the uh, violation of sovereignty and territorial integrity that has already taken place in the Crimea. And then there are also, you know, there's a broad range of, uh, of options that will be kept under, you know, that are under consideration. Uh, I think that extends also, we have already announced, um, and all of the G7 has announced that we're suspending um, participation in all G8 related activities uh, now, and, uh, and, and, you know, that, is, that has already occurred. Uh, so I think that, um, and there was a meeting, or there is a meeting, I think, of the, of the, that, uh, of the Budapest um, agreement, which was supposed to look at, was supposed to guarantee uh, what was going on. That's a, not my legal, not the legal terminology, but Ukraine with uh, Russian participation as well as participation from others. And I believe the Russians didn't come or are not coming or something. So, although they have, we've talked, we we've called for uh, obs international observers to be allowed into Ukraine and Crimea. So I think all of that is very much uh, laying out that uh, this action has costs, but they're also, uh, it's important to think about de-escalating tensions. And it's a matter that's under pretty much constant review. Our leaders are in contact, we're in contact with each other. So that's, uh, I'm not gonna go further than that on, on Ukraine and Russia just now. Um, turning to the other issues, well, Bitcoin, I think I'm going to leave for Heather. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a financial, you know, it is an issue for, for uh, financial regulators, perhaps, to uh, discuss um, with, with one another. Um, the other issue, which is a very important one, about the participation of young people in, uh, in G20 preparations, discussions, and so on, I think that many of us are open to and, and do do sort of serve in a way as ambassadors as well as Sherpas, ambassadors to other groups in the rest of the world on these issues. And there's a rather dynamic young woman that we met in yes. Sydney who is um, yes. pushing forward the youth event or the, the youth agenda uh, under the Australian presidency. So I'm sure Heather will want to speak about that. And again, it's important, there's just, you know, there will be 24 hours when leaders come together, and that's a limited and, uh, time. But there are many ways in which we want to listen to, bring in, and uh, interact with, and listen to the ideas of uh, others. 
Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, may yeah. I also say something about your, yes, your question about yeah. development? This is a really important part, and I think it was really in, uh, you know, after a year or two of the G20 leaders level that um, after the sort of immediate crisis had, had withdrawn that there was a very definite um, agreement that development issues were also very important for the global economy and for um, all of the G20 countries. Uh, the G20 is also special because with it, a number of the countries sitting around the table have very many people in poverty in their economies. So it's not just that development is an issue for somewhere else. You know, if you take India, and our Indian colleague often says that. So many of the things, many of the areas where we're working, whether it's transparency and anti-corruption, or whether it's infrastructure and investment, or whether it's the rule of law, or whether it's jobs and growth, these are all also kind of development issues. And, I th and resource mobilization is another one where we talk about, and there's a whole tax agenda, which we haven't even talked about, that's sort of part of what's, what's going on uh, in the G20. How we think about, um, ab about what the G20 does to involve and point to development issues, I think is a very important. We also have a development working group look looking this year at financial inclusion and a few other issues. So that is definitely a part of, of a, a kind of settled part, I would say, of the G20 agenda. Okay, thanks. Helen? Um, thanks, Matt. I think uh, it's a very important question about the, the role of women in, in G20. Um, Caroline's right, the, the chair, Holly, her name is Holly, who's chair of the, um, the Y20, the Youth 20, is um, running a very focused, ambitious agenda, and there will be a youth summit um, in Australia around the middle of the year in July. and. But one of, this is not necessarily gender specific, but it goes back to my point, the more that partner groups can actually focus on one or two key issues, so they're gonna focus on youth unemployment and, and bring, bring obviously the very important perspectives of what governments and, and others should be thinking about in trying to deal with youth unemployment. And, and uh, so that focused gender is really important. Um, there is also the, the, what we call the small G 20, the girls 20, which is a really interesting group of young women that I think, I think Google or, or one of the, uh, Google is the major sponsor of, I can't be sure, but so, and for that very reason that you mentioned, ma'am, it's about making sure there is a generation coming through who, who uh, will, will understand multilateralism to start with, understand how to use your voice most effectively going forward, but also continuing to put pressure on governments where it really matters. And uh, um, I, I, we're thinking of holding some event um, uh, sometime during the year where we can get this, this group of young women together um, in particular. Um, but it's a very important point. But I think when it comes to the best thing we can do for women is actually get, get women uh, into the workforce, but also uh, um, through the development agenda where, where we focus on, on the key issues. And on the development agenda, uh, as Caroline mentioned, we've, the challenge for G20 again is where do you add value? And I think um, we're focusing predominantly on three areas this year. Um, around this question around the financing of infrastructure in developing countries. Secondly, on helping uh, low-income countries um, through capacity building on their taxation regimes to try and build up the capacity of their balance sheets so they can actually fund um, some of the key issues, whether it's health or education or welfare. And, and thinking about financial uh, inclusion, there is a current work program around lowering the, lowering the costs of remittances, uh, the costs of transferring remittances from home to host country. And there's a target that G20 is working towards. I, I don't think we'll get there this year. It's meant to be delivered this year. It's very important. But in addition to that, really thinking about how do we use technology? How do we get basic financial services uh, into into particular areas in low-income countries because that's all about empowerment and access to, to, to real activity. There are other areas on, on food security. Again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of work that continues within the G20 space um, and also around human capital development. The other key area that the G20 will have to focus on and give some political support to is the post-2015 
development goals in the United Nations. And that process will play out over the next uh, year and a half. And so if G20 can add value in, uh, in that space, then that's important. And I think also Turkey may spend uh, quite a bit of time in their year next year as the next chair of, of G20. So uh, we need to do some work to, to help prepare for that. On, on Bitcoin, it, that's a really interesting um, question. I can honestly say no, <laughs> not at this stage. We, we haven't, uh, but clearly, you know, there are a number of issues out there that, that will evolve, that you never know what will end up on the G20 um, uh, agenda. But I think at this point, um, you'd have to really make a, a sort of strong case as to why G20 and not elsewhere. I, I, I won't um, say really anything more on, um, on Ukraine than what Caroline said, except it, it's a very fluid situation and, and we need to let uh, the intermediation play, process sort of play out and uh, keep a watching brief on it. Okay, well, November is a long time a away. Long. I think last November, I don't think anybody, Sweet. I certainly had never heard of a Bitcoin, so, so who knows whether, <laughs> what, what, will be, uh, what will be on the agenda. Um, let me just say, I think we have run out of time. Let me just say on womenomics, uh, two things. One, that uh, not only do we have uh, uh, these two ladies on uh, the stage with us here, but uh, the last three G20 Sherp, host Sherpas have been women. Uh, the Russian and the um, uh, Mexican uh, Sherpa, and, and the Turkish Sherpa is apparently changing hands uh, sometime this year, so we may, we may continue that strand. So if there's a little B boys 20, uh, you might want to aspire to do something else other than be a Sherpa, because it's a uh, dying breed. The other thing is we're going to do uh, the Simon Chera program on womenomics uh, later this year, probably in September. Uh, uh, working with the Japanese government, which obviously is focusing on this within Japan, but they're also interested in, in doing it, uh, okay. uh, talking, having the U.S. and Japan uh, talk about these issues internationally and, and, and work together in a cooperative way. In fact, that's already starting. So let me um, end here. I'm sorry we ran a bit over, but uh, appreciate your attention, and please join me in thanking our two uh, guests for their, their input and, and insight. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. Thanks, really Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.